Hi and welcome back to another video of JPlay. I am Marcus and yes, today it's finally time. I'm about to start my, let's call it, story. Not really talking about a campaign of folklore, The Affliction, which is in my mind a very old school RPG tabletop experience. It's pretty much a blend between typical RPG and a board game. Actually right down my alley. And this was also one of the games that were kindly gifted to me by a faithful viewer, um, Jolene. Thanks again for giving me this game. And here I'm really, really looking forward to my playthrough. Before I get started, the thing I typically forget, and I'm terribly sorry for that. A huge, huge shout out to all of my patrons and channel members out there. You guys are truly amazing. So if you want to join my little channel here you can do that right here on youtube you can follow me on patreon you can click that little thanks button beneath that video to support the show i highly appreciate that and yeah i think with that being said let's get into the story mode to learn a little bit what this game is all about embark on an adventure of dark fantasy steeped in fear myth and superstition hunt or be hunted by creatures of antiquity and legend search dangerous locales to find clues to the source of evil sinking its claws into the heart of the land devastating its people and settlements Free the denizens from the scourge of witchcraft and vampirism, opposed to spreading darkness as it overtakes the land by playing one of six unique characters whose will and knowledge grow as they face challenge after challenge. Harness the power of artifacts long forgotten and find rituals from the pages of the dreaded Necronomicon. Can you survive or will you play on as a ghost? Worse still, will you be doomed to transform into one of the creatures that hunt by night? As I never played this game before, I decided to start my little journey here in Story Journal 1, Adventure Begins. And in there we are going for story number one, which serves as some kind of a tutorial because a lot of these, let's say, individual things are outlined and are referring to the actual rulebook. And as far as I understand, I do have the second edition of the rules. At least I think could be terribly wrong. So if I do terrible mistakes, which I will most likely do anyway, then we can definitely blame it on old set of rules. <laughs> what? No. So this story here is called Everything Changes. It's set in dusk, which I believe is the introductory difficulty level. I think it goes up to midnight or nightmare. I think nightmare is then the ultimate threat, which you should never play. So this is broken down into so-called chapters. Uh, I don't actually know. I think it has this, this story only has two chapters in the end. It should play um, within 90 minutes. It may take a little bit longer. As I do a lot of talking, I want to introduce you to some of our, or to our heroes, to our characters at least, to some extent. And as usual, I'm talking way too much, explaining the stuff. So yeah, let's forget about those 90 minutes here. So this is pretty much chapter one. The tutorial tells us we are going to set up the game, which is already something I did, of course. And as I keep hearing that playing this game with two players is also already close to a nightmare, I decided to go with a three character game. And the first character I have really kind of chosen is the witch hunter here, who is basically mm, a little bit more tanky than the other players. He comes with a ranged weapon, um, which I haven't pulled out. It seems the one piece I forgot, so I need to find the crossbow here. Um, I'm using those um, Vita, which is basically our life points and PowerPoint trackers here. I don't know in which expansion they come, but yeah. I got them anyway, at least for our characters. I think for the enemies, I will use the standard trackers that come with the base game. Yeah, the Witch Hunter comes with two abilities here, which is in the scope and the tracker. I will explain you these things as we go. Um, they also all start the game with a special ability and he, I think he can never be spooked for example. So there are a lot of in-game effects which will call for various deity um, and one of those can be spooked and yeah, he is definitely not the afraid kind of guy. Over to our second character. I think this is Deborah. I think I gave her the name Deborah. Yeah, we have basically, I have character sheet for all of those. Yeah, this is Deborah. 
she is an arcanist and within the arcanist character class you do have two kind of how to focus character focus so there's a numerologist and there is the seeker for her i decided to go with a numerologist so that's basically another let's call it special ability which i will most likely forget <laughs> but yeah bear with me she starts the game with a stiletto, she has those two abilities here, so she has the runic dice and she has seek the chan uh, chakra, which definitely make her a very, very f fearsome enemy, uh, actually, to our enemies. Um, these are her attributes, this is her, these are her skills. She also starts the game with a ritual, which is a time stop in this case. These are pretty much one-offs, which you can also kind of use any time. And this, this one here, for example, after going for this occult test here of nine, this is definitely not nothing. All non-afflictions, those in the combat lose their next turn. This could be amazing. And afflictions are pretty much, let's call it, bosses and bosses. Also for these scenarios here. But all of the other creatures will be affected by that. And then, last but not least, we have our exorcist, Maximilian. Uh, so I keep hearing that in a two-player game, if you really are brave enough, you have to play with the exorcist, but I also already got the confirmation by a cool fella on YouTube here that I think I chose wisely, also using an exorcist for a three-player game. He is kind of our healer in this scenario. Uh, they also come with a character Focus, which I already know, he's a sanctifier, exactly. The sanctifier allows him to pretty much use his holy water he's starting the game with to basically heal other heroes, either himself or an adjacent hero, that is. He can use basically the holy water a little bit more efficiently. He starts with a prayer, um, which is here the banishment, help the ethereal find the way home. So basically all these ethereal enemies he can pretty much send back to hell or wherever they came from. Um, again, something I will most likely tend to forget. His special ability, you are never affected by bloodlust. Bloodlust, I could imagine, because he could transform into a werewolf <laughs> in this game. And I'm relatively certain that bloodlust is related to this, but there could be other status that could do stuff with it. And he also has two starting abilities here. That's the purification. It's an amazing one. Restore four Vita to yourself or an adjacent ally usable during a skirmish. So we have two kind of combats in this game, a skirmish and the normal map-based combat, which is something I really do like, that you have these one-offs, very short kind of encounters, these skirmishes um, compared to, let's say, a normal map-based combat that is a little bit more tactical and we have the blessing of the cross inflict 1d6 damage to anyone demonic spirit or undead creature that's pretty much a ranged attack and yeah will cost him one power point these are the cost to use those pretty amazing stuff so i really do think that the exorcist seems to be quite powerful and yeah those are our three characters for now the witch hunter will be our starting player we are using this massive metal disc here it comes two-sided we always start on the day side after um, basically, we are handing it over to someone else. Basically, it's going back and forth. We are flipping this to the night side. And day and night may have some implications on road and or um, off-road events, that is, which we will encounter rather sooner than later. But again, for now, our witch hunter will be our leader or starting player, that is. And again, we are starting at day. Let's check out how our story unfolds here. The arrival. You have traveled far. Entering a territory of mountains and hills, forests and ancient paths, as you near your destination, an oppressive veil descends as the sky becomes dim. The stagecoach you hired approaches an old stone building with a belfry and enormous arched wooden front doors whose scrollwork tells tales of horror and redemption. The coach rolls to a stop and you exit to stand before the church of the crossroads. The church is an age-old monument and gateway to this ancient mountainous territory. As you near the wooden doors to head inside, you hear the sounds of a struggle from within. Entering the church, you see an old curator cowering at the, at the hands of highwaymen. The highwaymen are ragged and filthy, with a dangerous edge of the desperate. They demand food and valuables. So first of all, the one thing that I did forget was to place our ridiculously small party marker here at the Church of the Crossroads, which is our starting space for this location. That's the neoprene game map that I think was already in extra. There is also a normal, much smaller 
um, paper map that comes with the game and quite honestly I'm not 100% sure if I will continue to use this one here or because again that's the only thing that you do to travel pretty much along these roads here on the world map here so it's incredibly big compared to what it's actually being used for but yeah let's see about that maybe I will simply use it for basically yeah, my, my tabletop gaming surface. Okay, let's see. So we are basically dealing with some highwaymen, it seems. And again, there is a nice little section here for a skill check tutorial. And I'm terribly sorry to all the folks who know this game pretty well or much better than I do. I will speed up relatively soon promised here. So what we have to deal with now is actually a so-called story skill check and in this case we have to convince the highwayman to leave peacefully. How this works is we are now rolling pretty much our skill die here. Um, I think that's the red one, doesn't really matter if you're using a red or a black one here. The difficulty of this test is an 8, so we need to roll an 8 or higher in order to achieve that, but we get to choose any one character. It could also be in a later test that we have to, a random character, all the characters have to do that. In this case we get to choose and quite obviously we may want to do this test with our exorcist, who's the only one who gets a bonus or plus one on this test, so in theory we need to roll a seven or higher so that's still a relatively high likelihood that we are going to fail but let's do it anyway and I believe we don't have any re-rolls whatsoever so seven or higher it is and it's a nine wow that's an amazing start for whatever reason I was kind of hoping that we are going to fail this one actually because then we would have basically directly went into our skirmished call it tutorial but in this case it was a success. You exert control and ask them to leave. They realize that the curator is not easy pickings and decide to take their trouble elsewhere. Gain a boon. Okay I think that's not too bad actually. So we get a random boon. I think it's for the hero who passed that test. At least I think that's a random pack of different boons. So let's see what we get. We are going for one in the middle here and that's at d6 to any die roll. Uh, I mean, that's simply insane. That's so insanely good as a reward. So yeah, I will totally give this over to Maximilian, our exorcist. And I think I may have forgotten our witch hunter is called Theodore, by the way, just in case that you wondered. But let's read on. The curator thanks you for driving the brigands away and for saving the church from being burglarized. He explains that this area has begun to attract an unsavory element, there are calamities far worse to the north. He says the priest received this a few days ago. He left immediately to investigate. Without warning, he lifts a covering from a table revealing a bloody mass of fur and flesh. Okay, we have our next story skill check. And in this case, we are dealing with a nerf for all characters. In this case, all characters have to do that. And yeah, I I think we, I think a lot of our folks do have an additional nerf. Yeah, yeah, I think at least the Witch Hunter and the Arcanist. So I think we should be okay. So the Witch Hunter has a plus two on nerf. And again, our target is a four. The Witch Hunter, that seven plus two is nine. Amazing. Then the Arcanist has a nerf of plus one. That's at least something also good enough. And the Exorcist doesn't have a bonus. And he's also good. Nice. So we resist the urge to become sick. You steady yourself against the revolting sight. You become centered and recover one Vita. Recover means um, basically it's similar to a lot of other um, fantasy board games here. Um, you cannot recover beyond your starting health that is. But if you would have gained Vita we could have gone um, above that. As we haven't lost any Vita just yet, um, keep in mind we dodged this very first Skirmish. We are good. So we can move on. After recovering from the shock of such disgusting sight, you examine it more closely. It seems unnatural. The curator explains wolves have been seen devouring people in the north. A group of Osterlink hunters tracked this one down, but no matter how many arrows and spear tips pierced its flesh, it would not stop moving. They brought it to the alchemist first, believing it was bewitched by some evil curse. Its form shifted and changed periodically in startling phases. It only stopped after that stone was removed from its stomach. He points to a small pebble encased in a glass on a pedestal near the table. Neither the priest nor alchemist know what it is, but they fear it is related to the source of the trouble, trouble in the north. 
Go to Osterling to seek out the missing priest and inquire of the people where they found this creature. It is of dire importance that you find the wolf beast slayer. Here are a few coins to help you with your journey. You're welcome to rummage through our cellar and see if you can find something useful to take with you. Return with news when you have found our priest. So here we have an attention. Each character receives one coin from the curator and draw two item cards to find out what you discovered in the church's cellar. It is up to you to decide which characters receive the item. If you cannot decide, use your dice to roll off. As I'm alone, I'm relatively certain I will be okay. Of course, I could consider playing it a little bit more role play. Let's see about that. So yeah, let's do that here. And I think this the one piece that didn't come with the game are actual gold coins or coins. But that's because I can imagine that you are dealing with a lot of those. But as we are still relatively early in our journey, I will use some custom metal coins here. They look pretty nice. I think they work quite well. Again, I think between adventures or so, I may want to write it down instead. But for now, I really do prefer those metal coins here. And then we are drawing our first item cards. And I have to mention that I am using the, what are those called, crafting and recipes card pack here. So we might find some recipes for more stuff. I was debating with myself if I should add that or not in my very first playthrough. I looked at some of those and thought, yeah, why not? Let's do that. That's really a massive pile of stuff. And I think this is also one of the complaints I keep reading that this item deck, because it's so huge, it's Really a hit and miss at times, but quite honestly, I like that. So let's do that. That's our first card here, some caltrips. And here we have a jade idol. And here I'm really not sure if they are of any use to us at all. The caltrips we can exhaust. It's an enhancement to place a snare token in an, any adjacent space. Anyone entering the space takes 1d4 snare damage. I mean, that's not bad. That is really not bad. And the Jade Idol, sell at the market to receive 1d10 times 3 coins. Yeah, why not? I mean, we get them both anyway. And I think in this case, we will give the Caltrips thematically to the Witch Hunter. And the Jade Idol, maybe to the Arcanist, not so much to the Exorcist. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. Let's carry on. Outside, you board the waiting stagecoach, which hastens your journey to the village of Osterling. So now we are dealing finally with the world map, which in this case means we are getting our immediate direction. I mean, we have been told um, we should move up north to Osterling, and I think that's basically what this is. Travel to Osterling. All characters gain a plus one stride. Stride is pretty much our movement. On their journey due, uh, due to the stagecoach, leadership should now switch to character two since you are transitioning from narrative to the world map. Pass the leader token to them with a day side showing because we have started our journey pretty much at, let's call it a city. We will always flip it back to the day side. So we will not start our travels in the night, obviously. That's something that you typically try to avoid in these old times. When a character two passes the token to the next character, they flip it to the night side. So when we are then moving to a different um, map or when we are basically after we have done our movement step, then um, we will basically switch back and forth between the day and night side. So we are moving this from Theodore, our witch hunter, to Deborah, our arcanist. Oh no, it's still day. What am I talking about? Let's switch to the world map once more. And again, we are here at the Church of Crossroads. Right now, our leader is Deborah, the Arcanist. Her stride is four. I believe all of our characters have a stride rating of four. I'm pretty sure that you can find boots or horses or whatnot to make this faster or more or less maybe even. I don't know, maybe you can get hurt. Also, but again, as long as we are now traveling to Osterling, we have our stagecoach, so we get a plus one on those, which means we are allowed to move up to five spaces. And there is no reason not to use our full movement. And again, we can now debate if we want to move um, off-road, so we can directly move in here, but then we would go for an off-road event, which I think, according to the rules or to the tutorial here, might be too tough for us. I don't know. Bad things can also happen on the road events or 
on the road. But I still think let's let's follow the proposal or the recommendation and let's simply move one, two, three, four, and five. We are still on the road, which means we are going to draw our very first road event. And yeah, we have a whole deck of road events. We are still, oh, that's a good point. Are we flipping this now to the night side or are we doing, I think not. I think we are now still on a day side. So now we are dealing with our very first road event. And in this case, again, we are looking at the day side of the cart. Tendrils of smoke. We were surprised by a group of ghosts on the trail ahead. As we passed, they moved right through us. Oh wow, that's that's insane. And this is really something where this game is a little bit different to the standard fantasy themed RPG. This is really more of a, oof, how to put it, yeah, more horror kind of scenarios here. Um, we will definitely deal with a lot of and not really fantasy creatures, but really werewolves, ghosts, um, cursed hounds, demons, you name it. But you will, we will not encounter orcs or goblins, for example, in this one. And this really, uh, let's say, a cool little twist on things. All characters must pass nerf 5 to gain a temporary power point. These are the temporary power points. That's a cool thing, so we can gain more. Fail and become spooked 8. And again, Spook 8 also means we can, in theory, ignore that if we are passing that test. The cool thing is, I believe our Witch Hunter can ignore that anyway, but of course he wants to make it just to get the temporary power point. Power points are really great, not just for presentations, but also for really dealing with a lot of our abilities. So that's the currency for dealing with those. Okay, let's roll some dice. Yes, we will roll an awful lot of those. Um, we will start again, not with our leader now, with the Arcanist. Um, does she have nerf? Yeah, she gets the bonus on nerf, right. So she has a plus one. Oh, that was awfully close, but that is good enough. Six plus one is seven. Definitely, we will gain a temporary power point. Nicely done. I will do that in a second. On my little wheel, then it's the Exorcist. He doesn't have any nerve. No, he was the one without any bonuses. Seven, he is good. Amazing, amazing. And the Witch Hunter got a plus two, actually. That's an eight. So they all get the temporary power point. Now that's amazing. Okay then, then we are discarding this card pretty much. I don't even know if it's basically shuffled back into the deck. For now we are discarding it. I think it doesn't really matter too much. We are flipping this to the other side. We are handing it over to Maximilian, our exorcist. But then we are basically continuing our travels and I think we will move one, two, three, four, five directly into Whalen Point, which is another town where we can take advantage of town services. And it also means we are not doing any events there in a town. And I think in one expansion, which I've seen, there are actual town events, but not in this playthrough, it seems. We are flipping it back to the day side and then handing it back to the witch hunter afterwards, I believe. But I think for now, the exorcist is still the leader. And then we are checking our little cheat sheet here. We are at Valence Point and we get two services per visit. This only means that the town is big enough and busy enough that we can do these things. And all of our characters can do two the services per visit. Most of those, as you see here, are costing us money, but our heroes, um, they all come with, let's call it location extras. And that's really something I have to spend some time now to think if we want to use that. So for example, ah, that's the Church of the Crossroads actually. Ah, he could have gained one holy water. No, okay, it is what it is, I forgot that. And I didn't travel into that. I wanted to, to head out. Otherwise, I think we may have lost a day or so. I don't know. But that's basically where we're at. But I think let's not really look at those for now because 100 coin, 50 coins, you see it for yourself. We just gained one. So <laughs> let's not worry about that too much. And I believe the only thing that we can afford would be here at the Physician, um, getting some stitches, restore one Vita for every coin spent. But so far we haven't lost any Vita yet. So I think, yeah, we are pretty much okay. So with the Tinker, we can arm our companion. We don't have any companions yet. We can hone our weapon. We get basically plus one damage to a weapon for one chapter. So a lot of things that you can do. 
But I also do see, oh, we could go to the inn for one to five coins, bet up to five coins and roll a d10. One to three you lose, four to seven it's a draw, and eight to ten double your bet. And if you have a trickery bonus, add plus one to this roll once per visit. And yeah, down here at the market, oh, that's good. Here at the market, actually, um, we could go there, draw one item once per visit and purchase this if you wish. May sell items for half their cost. And I think we did get the, where is it? The Jade Idol, exactly, sell at the market. And we get the two visits here. I think, uh, two services here, let's totally do that. And I think in this case, uh, we are not getting half of it. We are basically getting the price we are rolling here. I mean, that's pretty cool. So we are rolling a D10. 10, awesome. And zero is 10 in this case, of course. So we are getting 30 coins. So I think this totally changed our options in this case. Now, that is nice. So this card is out of the game for now. Well, it's basically this card, I think it can come back. But now we do have some serious coin. I think with 31, that's a totally different story actually. But I believe we also get to draw a card here. Draw one item once per visit. Yeah, let's do that. So we're visiting once here. So we're drawing that item and we are allowed to buy that. That's a net. We can throw the net for encounters. Target stride is reduced by 1d4. For skirmishes, target receives minus 5 might. But that's 30 coin. But that's really not a terrible weapon, actually. It's really not a terrible weapon. It's ranged and I believe it doesn't really have a range. So we can throw it as far as we can see pretty much. It's a one-handed thing. Oh, that's not bad. But we could also gain a torch token and a wooden stake, which I believe would definitely help us with any vampires or what not. So this is a torch which we can use as a light source for one entire chapter. So that's not bad. And we can throw it for 1d4 damage and then discard. And quite honestly, I don't know what this 1h means. I don't know, but I'm not worrying about that right now. I may want to check the geek or so. Okay, I think I would rather go for at least one torch for five. So we are paying 10, getting five back in this case. Okay, that's not a bad start. Um, I think unlike Gloomhaven, where you are not allowed, really not allowed to change item possessions. I th still think this is a typical RPG style. And as soon as, as long as I agree with myself, basically, I will hand those over. But again, I will keep role playing somewhat in the back of my head. So um, the torch, I don't want to give to the witch hunter because his weapon is two handed, I believe. So maybe we want to give it to... Oof. The Exorcist? Yeah, I think the Exorcist with a torch, I think this does make sense actually. Nice. So we still have uh, some money. We could go for the wooden stake. Mm, I may want to check that. Yeah, there are not other things. Again, I could visit again and simply draw a, diff a second card, for example. Or we could say, I, th I really don't know that all those items here enough in order to make a more informed decision here. I could go for the vitriol maybe, the spirit of wine. Let's have a look at those. So here we are. Hmm, the spirit of wine plus 10 might for four rounds. So the vitriol thrown for 1d6 damage, push two, or the expired tonic, recovering six vita. I really think recovering vita could be amazingly important. Oh yeah, the wooden stakes plus one damage to vampires for one encounter. Oh, that's not bad too actually or plus one to stake a sleeping vampire. Yeah, there are things in the game where you have to do these kind of things as far as I know. Again, I haven't really read ahead in the scenario storybook, of course, I promise. So the wooden stake, I think, ah, let's do that, right? Let's pay 10 for the wooden stake. I, I really do like that. And we definitely do give this to the exorcist too, I believe. Okay, we still have some money left but not enough. And we have 15 left. We do have 15 left. So we could go for really either of those. And the expired tonic for 10 sounds like a very cool idea. So I will do that. We'll pay 10 more. And the expired tonic, I think it also doesn't matter too much. The witch hunter already got the call trip. So I think let's also give this one to the arcanist. So we have basically, she has visited the apothecary 
and the market. So her two visits are over. And again, I'm not 100% sure if you are supposed to hand over gold to someone else or so what happens to the money if you sell something. All the rewards that you get from um, dealing with encounters or enemies, that's really given to all the characters. But really selling this stuff, I believe that's still a very individual thing for that character, but I'm pretty sure you can trade off those tokens in the end. But I think that's that. We are down to six bucks um, and I think we used our time in Valen Point nicely. We are going to discard the net. We are not buying it. it. Was okay, I believe, but then I will not gamble here. Again, we have our mission. So we are moving back to the world map. And the idea is to move here to Osterlink. So in this case, uh, no, we cannot move through those spaces. These are impassable um, terrain spaces. So in theory, in this case, it would be much quicker to move one, 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 for example. But that's not allowed because here we see a red border. So we could do one, one, one. But yeah, again, the game doesn't recommend me to do that. So I will listen. And again, we have passed the starting for the leader token to the exorcist. Again, we are leaving Whaling Point at daylight and we still get our plus one, right? So it's one, two, three, four, five. I believe that this is okay. We don't have to count this space. At least this specific example is being mentioned in the rules that the four movement points would move them here from there. Could be terribly wrong, but again, it's an RPG. Let me know if you think that is wrong but we have basically moved for the day. So let's draw our next road event. Again, we are doing this at daylight. Wanted, we were approached by a group of watchmen who were looking for the lawless. If any character is wanted, no, we are not. The group must skirmish with watchmen. Otherwise, they thank you for your cooperation and the leader gains a boon. Oh, he already got a boon. Can we have more than one boons actually? That's an interesting one. I think, <laughs> let's see about that. So we are basically getting another boon and that's take an additional move. That's a good, I think, mm, can we use those spoons also on the world map? I don't think so, right? This really feels like cheating. No, I think not. I think this only works in encounters or on the adventure map. But yeah, that was an okay outcome and I didn't even have to ask the Giga character may only possess two boons at any time. They are discarded after use, making sense. But now we are moving basically back to the Witch Hunter as our leader. So we are flipping this now to the night side. So things could turn out pretty ugly now. But then let's continue our travels, right? One, two, three, four four and five. Yes, the bridge does count as a road and it also counts as a space. I'm relatively certain about that. So we are dealing with our next road event and this time we are dealing with the night side. Fledglings! Several villagers approached us on the road. As they draw near, we noticed that their skin was pasty white and fresh bite marks marred their necks with an unearthly hunger. These fledgling vampires attacked skirmish with vampires. So we do actually see a fight in this very first chapter of the game. It's not a full-fledged fight because it's only a skirmish. But yeah, let me take out those pesky vampires. So here we are. This would be the site if you would deal with them during an encounter and we do have a miniature for them. But as we are dealing with a skirmish, we are flipping this to the other side and this is pretty much a stripped down version of a fight. The first thing that we are doing is to give them their strength. Basically that's what we have to defeat them and this is based on the actual player count and this is the one piece which I also noticed in my preparations which kind of reminds me of Eldritch Horror in respect to balancing or scaling. It seems that in a three or four player game you're rolling the six-sided die. So there could be a reason not to play three players but four players. But again, as bookkeeping in this game, I believe is relative, let's call it cumbersome, at least when you're playing it alone. I'm, 
I don't even want to think about how many special abilities I already missed actually to, to activate <laughs> these very few rounds. Again, that's the cool piece. If you continue your stories later on and you want to add or remove characters, you can do so. And there are tips and tricks how you are introducing new characters basically in a, give, in a let's say, already running campaign that is. So if I really feel that this is massively too difficult, I might want to consider adding, adding a fourth character at some point in time. But yeah, for now, we have to roll a six-sided die to determine our strength. And yeah, the game really comes with all sorts of dice. Um, so I would think I will use the one that ships with the game. And I think we don't get any bonuses or, or not. So no, I think that's basically the strength that we get. And that's a two. I think we are okay with a two, actually. And I must find the little markers that come with the game to, to pick, I think, but I think I will go for these wooden ones here, yeah, I think. The other ones are really tiny, tiny um, cardboard versions of that, and I think this is that. So I think from here, we are pretty much good because with two or three, we are not getting any modifiers. Of course, with only one, they would get a minus eight defense, but as their strength would have increased, they would basically gain plus one, plus eight might and plus eight defense, which is a lot. So the skirmish power in this case is basically true for everyone who's getting, let's call it bitten. It's just um, lose 2d4 Vita. And one random character that was that was hit is consumed with bloodlust four, and I think this is where <laughs> the exorcist comes into the picture. He can basically, or he's never affected by bloodlust. Then we are looking. We are playing on the dusk level. There is twilight. There is midnight, and there is um, nightmare. In this case, our might modifier is basically zero. Nice. So yeah, let's deal with our skirmish. And there is a handy dandy player aid here. First of all, we are determining the strength. That's what we done. We have placed our skirmish marker representing the skirmish strength. So we are good looking at the uh, current strength, and we already identified that. Attack of or defend. Now that's really something that you typically only do um, in a skirmish, but there are also advanced combat rules where they say you can also use this attack or defense mechanism in the normal encounter on the tactical map. And I have not yet made up my mind if I'm going to use that or not. But in the skirmish, you get to do that. So each character can now decide of each round basically if you if they want to attack or if they want to defend. You are suffering some, you can still attack, basically also when you defend, but you are suffering some, I think a minus 10 on their attack, but you get some more defense. I really don't know actually. I <laughs> really have to check my character's abilities now, how I want to use them or not. Quite honestly, I do think we haven't taken any wounds whatsoever. So I think I will have them all at the attack stance for the very first round of combat. So they're not gaining any bonuses and but also sufferers, don't suffer any penalties, whatever, it's basically a zero. If we would have flipped this to the other side, to the defense, we would gain a plus two to our defense, which is a 10% increase of being successful. That's really not nothing. We are also losing 10% of our might, which is our attack value. So I think in this case, with only two, I feel somewhat comfortable. So let's roll some dice. We have chosen our stance for this round. For the next round, we could go for something else, but I really do hope we are getting rid of them actually. But yeah, maybe not, right? It's really not so easy. So first of all, we are doing the creature's turn. First, the controller, that's basically rolling the game. I have to play them all. In this case, we are rolling the so-called percentile die. And here I was really thinking if I should have went for a real D100, so you know these big balls of 100, or if I should go for these dice here. These dice, uh, basically those percentile dice, tend to confuse me. So what's a 100, what's a 1? <laughs> But I will for now use them, but I would be really curious to hear what you are using um, when you are rolling D100s, and then I might reconsider that. So we are basically rolling the D100, and that's the attack strength for those vampires. We are not rolling for basically each character, we are simply comparing this roll to the defense rating of all our characters, that is. And that's a 51, and with a 51, I'm relatively certain that everyone is hit because they typically have a defense rating here around 37, the Exorcist has a 36, and the 38 for the Witch Hunter, but 
this case. Wow, that was an amazing roll for those vampires. So we are looking at the skirmish power again. And I really do like these drilled down version of combat. And quite honestly, I wouldn't mind if the whole combat system of this game would be like this. Actually, I really do like this. It's very clever, very quick um, and still somewhat meaningful and impactful. You still can make decisions within those right now. Not so much, but I really do like that. So lose 2d4, 2d4, are you kidding me? And one random character that was hit is consumed with bloodlust. Okay, everyone was hit basically. So again, we have to roll some dice. Well, their defense is 60. 60 compared to our 30 something, are you kidding me? So we're rolling for Witch Hunter. Um, we are rolling them off basically individual. Okay, that's a six. Uh, so they're losing pretty much six life points. I will note that down somewhere and then we'll do that accordingly. Yeah, let's do that. So six. Then we have the Arcanist, Deborah. She's also hit. That's a four in total. So six, four and Exorcist is taking five. Wow, that's really not nothing actually, but we are not done yet. We still have to deal with a bloodlust here. So a random character. So it's one to two is the witch hunter, three to four is arcanist and five to six is the exorcist. Ah, awfully close. So the arcanist can now basically try to um, basically go for this test here. It's a bloodlust four, so I think it's beatable. So next we are checking the resist bonus is faith. Unfortunately, she doesn't have a faith bonus. So she simply has to roll as it is, right? Yeah, we are rolling the d10 for her. Six, no, it's a four. Four is okay, or at least doable. Um, so let's see, no, come on. <laughs> now we are failing. We rolled so well on these tests before, and now we rolled the two. Okay, yeah, she basically gains the bloodlust status, which is actually kind of a good thing. So we gain plus two damage. I mean, I take that, but we are also suffering uh, minus two on speech and minus two on faith and minus three max vita. I think that's problem. Wow, and allies receive minus one speech to your foul presence. Ooh, that's really not good. Great, and then we also have to check the vampirism here. The character becomes affected by bloodlust, which she just did. They are becoming a vampire and receive the modification shown in the status table as well as your. Yeah. Great, so we are vampire. The arcanist is a vampire. <laughs> okay, gain bite attack. They receive an extra attack during encounters. Bite 1d4 damage, no damage bonus, in addition to their normal attack. I take that. That's not bad. Uh, when kill, they become a vampire instead of a ghost. Uh, if this occurs while adventuring, replace their character with a vampire, standy or miniature. Da 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 da. Uh, if that happens on a world map or during the story narrative, use the open road map tile and place all characters so we have to fight them basically. A character who is affected by bloodlust is immune to the lycanthropic status and the other way around and characters affected by bloodlust or lose their companions and may not gain new ones until the status is cured. That was terrible. Oof, okay, I really have to write this one down. There are no tokens for those, I believe, for those status tokens, at least as far as I um, know or noticed, but yeah, I have to write it down somewhere. But wow, that was terrible. I really don't like these. I do like this when this happens. I think in, I think you can also become a vampire in Skyrim, right? At least in the one before, and that, uh, I did enjoy that actually. <laughs> was kind of fun. But yeah, we are still in the middle of combat and now our heroes get to fight back. Again, the defense of those vampires is a 60 and then our might bonuses is typically a four or three. So that's really not all that great. So we are basically still adding the, or rolling the percentile die and adding a three or four, no, four for the witch hunter. I think there is nothing else. Ah, yeah, we can use, that's a good one. We can use the in the scope from the witch hunter. I almost forgot that game. Plus von might with ranged weapons. We do have a ranged weapon during the first round of combat using, usable during a skirmish. Now that's nice. So we're getting a plus five, plus four. So also a nearly a 10% increase in our chances. So let's roll those. And that's an 81 plus the nine, that's 90. Definitely a hit, um, which means this one is going down. But I think this only goes down after 
we have done that. I think first of all we are collecting all our hits and then we are reducing. So we are not directly reducing it and basically can use those minus eight as far as I understood. We simply have to remember that we have hit them once. But yeah, I totally take that. Then it's the Arcanist. Um, she has a plus three on her might. And she could, no, this doesn't work doing a skirmish. She has to seek the chakra, which is also a pretty powerful thing, actually, which would once per round, but not doing a skirmish. And I think we also need to spend the one power point for the witch hunter, yeah, because he was using that skill. I will do that in a second. But we're losing the temporary point, which is fine. So it's the Arcanist with a plus three. And sorry, I, I'm really learning the game. I really try to stay on top of things. That's why I'm really taking it rather slow right now. And 77, okay, that's good enough. I'm relatively certain that um, the vampires are dead and gone. We have just formed a new vampire, isn't that lovely? But right now we are still okay. And I think she got a plus two, no, gain two damage actually. Gain two damage, but she's losing three max vita. I think that's really a problem. That is really a problem. So she's more likely to die. And then it's the exorcist. And I think the exorcist is now using his thing here. Here, maybe I should show that to you, the purification. Um, we can do that or use that during the skirmish and basically any time. I think it doesn't really count as our action as far as I understood. I think we can use them as many times as possible, not just once per round. And I think we need to do that. Um, we definitely give four to... Mm. The Arcanist is down to 17. Um, but she lost minus three Vita and her max Vita, so she would only gain one from that. So I think this would be a waste. So I think let's not do that. Let's give definitely four to the Witch Hunter. So he goes back to nine or 19. That is, and I think we will do the same for himself. So he's spending two power points in this case, 21. I think that was worth it. And then he's still rolling his die. I think this is really how those abilities actually do work. We will roll, but they're dead anyway. But uh, 39 plus his, I think, three, four, that's not good enough. But again, we have inflicted one, two wounds. So those vampires are dead and gone. So each of our characters will simply gain 10 coins out of this. Nice. Okay, that was quite a battle. Um, so we are getting rid of those fledglings here. Not really a nice event actually, but this was our first skirmish. And again, I do like that mechanic a lot actually. I really do. And ooh, I think, ooh, who was the starting player? I think it was the witch hunter. I think it was the witch hunter, I believe. So we are handing it over to the Arcanist. It's daylight. She's not yet a vampire, um, which I believe she can. <laughs> She's fine, actually. So let's continue to move, right? One, two, three, four, five. We have not quite made it to Yorotrusk. Um, so we need two more spaces. We don't need to end our movement there, I believe. So we can move on, but we may want to maybe try to heal there. The vampirism, I don't know. Seems to be a big town or a city almost. So I think we might be fine, but we still have to draw our road event for the day. And it's Fauna. We found a wounded fawn laying on the edge of the path. Foul claw stuck in its ribs, oozing green ichor. Any one character must pass Ecology 6 to learn something about the claw and gain 15 or lore is basically our experience points. Failure causes you to injure yourself on the claw and gain a corrosion token. Yeah, corrosion sucks. Must pass. Okay, we have to do that. So it seems we cannot simply move around that. So in this case, I believe it doesn't matter. None of us has the ecology skill, so we are not getting any bonuses. So we simply need a six to go on. Yeah, I think we will. Let's have the exorcist do that. So again, we are hoping for a six or more on that die. Awesome, awesome, you are a star. Um, so he gains 15 lore. Amazing. Okay, then let's move to Nightside and hand it over to the Exorcist again. We are discarding the swarm slash wounded animal. Question now is, are we going to move into Yorotrusk or are we moving on? One, two, three, four, five. 
Hmm. I really am tempted to get rid of that bloodlust as soon as possible. The problem is that we can get rid of the bloodlust by going to the chapel. But we need to spend law instead of coins and she doesn't have 30 law. Purification, rid yourself of bloodlust, cursed or possessed status. Down at the gypsy encampment, also lore. Yeah, we could get rid of the lycanthropy or the transformed status. And we can draw a tarot card to return a character in limbo with full vita and pps. So I guess we are not going to enter town. Oh boy. <laughs> How many more steps do I then need later on? Maybe that does make a difference. Let's say we end it here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. If I move it to one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Mm. That would make a difference. So we make it there a little bit quicker. But we can still heal there for her. She can spend one coin just to get her back to her starting Vita, right? Which is now an 18, basically. Yeah, let's do that. So one and two, we're ending our turn there, which means we are flipping this then to the other side when we hand it over to the Witch Hunter. But for now, it is still the Exorcist who goes First, and I think again, we will heal with the Arcanist. I think she can do that here for the stitches, right? So for one coin, she basically heals that one wound she still has. Yeah, I think this does make sense. And then she can still take advantage of two more services. We are basically in the biggest town here, Yorotrusk, up to three services. So I think let's check for the market. So she will draw a market card and then she can decide if she wants to buy that. Okay, that's a craft. That's basically one of those new ones. That's 30 coins. She cannot afford this. And in order to craft this one, we need a lead bar, wood and a fur pelt. And this would result in a burda, which is crushing and cold steel, basically a weaponry with 2d4 damage. It's two handed. But wow, that's not bad. But again, before we are allowed to sell this, or get it or use it, we need to find all these other items. Um, and I think we can do that again, right? So we can pretty much visit the market several times. No, once per visit. Yeah, once per visit, so that she doesn't get it. But all the others get it too. So I think, yeah, we cannot afford this, so let's keep drawing. So we are discarding this. Then it's the witch hunter, he will also barter. Um, plus, wow, that's so cool, the ecology. I mean, that's really cool, right? But 40 coins, we don't have 40 coins. Maybe I should really not buy stuff here, not worry about buying stuff. So this also doesn't help. And I'm really wondering, I mean, we had those, um, where are those? The Jade Idol here. I mean, the price is not here. And again, the rules tell me to draw a random card, an item card, but what if I draw this for purchase? I mean, there is no point that I roll the die, buy it and then sell it for the same price somewhere else, right? So what do we do with those? Pretty sure it has been answered. If you know an answer, let me know. But I think, should I really keep going um, with the money I have? Or should I maybe for the witch hunter also consider to spend some coin to give him two Vita back? Yeah, let's do that. So he's basically going back to his starting life point level and therefore he's simply spending two more bucks. Yeah, let's do that. And then I'm not really worrying, we are moving on. So we are handing the leader marker back to the witch hunter. We are moving one, two, three, four and five up here again we have to draw a road event we are still in broad daylight sick and the dead this can't be good we came across an abandoned cart many bodies were piled upon it bring out your dad no causing a putrid stench a few feet away we saw the dead bodies of those who were pulling the carts okay all characters oh god Oh, first of all, these are the road events. And second, these are the day events. I, I don't want to think about what is happening at night on these streets here. <laughs> That's insane. That's insane. Wow, and no one has ecology. So yeah, we are finally rolling some more dice, right? So we start with the witch hunter. Eight, he's good. Then it's the arcanist. She's good, awesome, 10. And then it's the exorcist, and he's also good. Wow, okay, that was incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, but we are not gaining anything. At least we would have gained some lore from this, come on. Give us some break. 
Well, that's basically it. We are moving the leader token to Deborah, and it's night now, and we are almost on our way. One, two, three, four, five. I still think that this is an extra space moving out here. Maybe I messed that up earlier on. I think we cannot move from here directly to here. This would make sense, but okay, it is what it is. I'm not taking it back. Um, yeah, then we have to draw our next road event, this time at night. So this must be horrible. Hack in the wood. Mm -hmm. A ramshackle huts could be seen just off the road. A gnarled and angry face peered at us from out of the doorway. The hag within spit a curse in our direction. All characters become cursed for. So again, we check our little cheat sheet here and the resist is occult. And I think nearly everyone has an occult. So the witch hunter has an occult of plus one and I, he, I haven't even checked what this means. So we need a three or higher. That's a four, he's good. The arcanist has an occult of plus two. That's an 11, now, of course, 10 or more, that's cool. And then I really have to check if he has anything that would give him a plus something. No, no, he has to live with the base result. It doesn't count, it was an eight, but that's my typical thing. If it falls out of the dice tower, I roll again and it's still good. Okay, I take that. So we are not getting cursed. Your max Vita is reduced by four and you receive minus one to all skill check. Now that's terrible. I mean, it's already awful in Eldritch in Arkham Horror, but this is also very, very bad, it seems. Okay, dodged that bullet, it seems. These events are horrible. Horrible. And there is a whole pile of so-called world events, which I'm not even using. I think you draw or you're supposed to draw one at the start of each chapter, I believe, and it will change the world. It seems there are also some beneficial ones there, but maybe with the next story or so, we may want to consider adding those. Okay, that was the night event. And again, we are moving to daylight with our exorcist, Maximilian, and he's simply moving one, two, three three spaces into Osterlink. So we finally made it here. Osterlink's ailment, that's basically the next part of this chapter. Use town services. Only the physician and gypsy caravan services are available in the town of Osterlink during this story. And I actually do hope that they mean the gypsy encampment instead of the gypsy caravan services. But okay, I think gypsy yeah, doesn't really help us. The physician, again, would be amazing if we would have the... Uh, no, that's wrong. Um, this is only at the chapel services, actually, for the lore. No, we cannot get rid of our bloodlust here. So I think let's carry on. Let's do some more reading. In Osterling, the streets are deserted with the exception of an occasional townsperson hurrying home or a drunk vagabond asleep in the alley. The few villagers you see scurrying on their way pause only to regard you with cautious stares. You raise your arm and call out a friendly greeting, time and again, with only quickly averted eyes as a response. It does not take much to sense that something is wrong. Oh no. You catch sight of a street urchin eyeing you from the side alley. And like the rest, it seems her curiosity is winning over her caution. You wave her over and she hesitantly approaches. When you ask her about the town and why everyone seems afraid, she looks nervous and says, Many people are worried because of the strange things that are happening. It is worse in the countryside and a lot of the farm folk have come into town. The inn is completely sold out. You ask the girl what she knows about wolves and the priest. For a moment she feigns ignorance, but after a bribe of food she tells you about the many recent wolf sightings. She warns that some have claimed that the wolf seems to change in the moonlight. With a full mouth the urchin says she knows nothing of visiting priest, but that you might be able to find out more answers at the end. In. Okay, but I, I, I thought we don't have an in actually. Interesting. Okay, then we have another choose your path tutorial. There will be times when the group will be have to make a choice. But just right now, you will know not know the consequences until after the choice has been made. And this is again where replayability might become a problem in the end, if you know these branching here, if, because you only have one outcome, at least I think. So let's see, choose your path. Will you give the urchin some spare change? Choice one, one character may give the street urchin a coin. If you have one, the character to do so must read story moment 25. If you decide to be uncharitable, the leader must read story moment 70 on page 50. I mean, we have the money, right? 
I think the exorcist, I think maybe the arcanist. She has a soft spot for this urchin. So she's spending not the fire, so she gets full back in a moment. So we are going to read story moment 25. As thanks, you toss a coin to the filthy child who catches it midair and makes the shiny disappear quickly as a blink. She turns to go, but then pauses to say, I know one more thing. The wolves like to hide in a tall grass, ambushing their prey. Be careful. Gain the blue story marker. Okay, that's nice. I have to find it in a second. Oh no, here's the back of story markers. <laughs> Let's see, it's a blue story marker, right? This one is this. Story markers are awards that can either cause a positive or negative event later in a story, but players will not know which is the case until it's revealed. Don't read ahead in the story. A story marker cannot be given to another character. Okay, so we give it to the Arcanist, right? She's carrying this one. Uh, once the story is completed, all story markers are discarded. So we are keeping this for the entirety of the story, it seems. Okay, nice. True to the urchin's words, Theon is bursting with people and heated conversation. Most of the patrons look to be farmers, with the occasional merchant in the crowd. The room goes quiet as you enter and you sense that you are not welcome. The innkeeper speaks. What is your business here? You tell the crowd that you are looking for information, specifically about the missing priests and strange wolves that have been giving the town trouble. The innkeeper crowds. We don't know anything about a priest and we can take care of a few wolves without any help from the likes of you. His words are fierce, but you note several of the patrons look uncertain. Ignoring the others' uncertainty, he continues. We have no rooms here. You have a drink, but afterwards, I suggest you move on. We are dealing with our next skill check, a trickery skill check. And this needs to be a random character, but as we don't have any trickery anyway, I think it doesn't matter too much, I think at least. So yeah, let's simply roll the six-sided die here again. One, two, two is the witch hunter and so on. And in this case, it's the exorcist who has to take a trickery seven roll. So yeah, we can leave the dice tower in here. I think he doesn't have any bonuses from anything else. No, I don't think so. And that's a seven. He makes it. Are you kidding me? As you stick around attempting to gather any information from the crowd, it is apparent that not everyone is happy with you being here. Bottle flies through the air right at you. You deftly dodge the incoming projectile. The bottle shatters against the wall behind you. Luck seems to be with you. Gain plus one on your next search roll. Okay, that's nice. I have to write this one down. And that's for him, otherwise we would have lost to Vita. The assault by the crowd has upset you. They are gaining confidence, having made the first move. They are now getting ready for a good old-fashioned bar fight. Okay. Choice one, if you decide to calm down the crowd to prevent somebody from getting hurt, read story moment 37. Choice two, if you decide to teach these peasants a lesson for being uncooperative, read story moment 58. Quite honestly, this is something where I want to roleplay this. The Arcanist, I think, may have been a little bit more hmm, reluctant to fight, but I think the Exorcist, pretty sure, he has some arrogance in it. And the, so is true the Witch Hunter. They really dealt with a lot of these folks, and I think they're both saying, come on, we teach these fellas a lesson. So we are going for Story Moment 58. And obviously, I'm trying to cover everything else, and I don't read ahead, of course. You don't have time to waste on these farmers, but a fight is inevitable. So you decide to take the first shot. Bar fight! Skirmish with an angry mob and apply a minus one to the skirmish counter. Oh, that's a good one. So we're getting a minus one. So they're not really the most heaviest thing. So if we're rolling well, we might end up with a one or so. But of course, we can also end up with five. Let's see. And that's a four. Minus one is three. So they do one more damage, but they are losing five might. Okay, I think I am not too bad with that. So what are they doing actually? Lose 1d4 Vita. And if the mob's total attack roll is 80 plus, increase the skirmish. Oh, wow, they're adding more. Up to the maximum for the number of characters. So basically up to six in this case. Oof, wow, but that's a nasty one. That's truly a nasty one. Again, I have to decide if I want to go on the attack or the defense defensive side and honestly I will put the Arcanist to the defensive side for her it's a little bit more dangerous but we have bandages and whatnot so I think we are okay so yeah let's 
I think we are simply rolling some dice now, right? We have determined the strength, we have placed the skirmish marker, we have decided if we want to attack or defend. Yeah, it's the creature's turn. So let's roll some die. Again, we have 38 for the witch. Now let's roll. 34. 34, right? And they have minus 5 might. So it's 29, actually. So I think none of us gets hit. Okay, that wasn't terrible at all. So we are now basically fighting back. I still think the witch hunter is using one power point. So he's going down to 4 to use his in the scope... No, it's a passive ability. I think he doesn't have to spend those. No, it's a passive ability. So he's basically going back to six because I already spent the two. Just notice that um, because he still has got the temporary in bump there. No, I think he can do that no matter what. Awesome. So he gets the plus five plus. No, there's no plus on the crossbow, but he has a plus four. So it's still a plus nine for him. That's, okay. that's enough. 35, their defense is 42, plus 9, that's 44, which is good enough. So I'm not sure how to track that, and I don't know. I think, yeah, I, I think I do know why they're doing it this way, actually. So let's use those, I don't know, purple markers here to... That's basically one hit from the Witch Hunter. Then we have the Arcanist. Because she defended, she has a minus 10. She gets a plus Four from her stiletto, um, plus three, so, it was pl so basically plus seven, minus ten, so minus three on this roll. But 89 is certainly enough. Let's add one more. And then it's the exorcist. He has a plus four, plus five from his um, weapon, the aspergillum. So that's a nine. Very nice. Nine. And... 42 plus 9, so they are basically dead and gone. So we have three hits, one, two, three, they are dead and gone. We are getting six coins each, nicely done. So we have also resolved that skirmish. And again, I must say, I do enjoy those skirmishes. They are really, really nicely done. And then let's carry on. The tension leaves as quickly as it escalated. These villagers are scared. It explains their short fuse, but what is more surprising is how defeated they seem once they've calmed down. It's as if they believe no amount of fighting will help. After peace is restored, a farmer approaches you nervously and says, Your priest passed through my land, inquiring about the way to Nurian's Hollow. Okay. I told him of a shortcut I know. A day later, crazed wolves came down off those hills, devouring my livestock and attacking my family. We ran here to Osterling to find help, but everyone's too scared to leave town. If you agree to destroy those wolves, I will tell you of the shortcut. Interesting stuff. So we have another choose your path encounter. Can you spare the time to help? Choice one. You decide that you cannot spare the time to help him with his woes. Read story moment 78. Or choice two. You decide to help the farmer with his troubles. Read story moment 46. I will end my playthrough for today and we'll let you decide what direction to go for. I will simply count the comments and votes. If I don't get that many, I really don't know how much interest there is in this video. I will basically decide on my own. I will also not read ahead in these story moments here. So again, let me know what you think. Again, we are helping them or we are, we are not the farmer, that is. I can imagine what happens with um, what what happens when we are helping him might lead to another fight or so. The other thing would be we are traveling on our own, but might still be maybe surprise attacked or so. Could still be an encounter. I don't know. But again, I'm really curious to hear what you think. So let me know, and I will yeah consider your votes accordingly. And yeah, with that being said, I really do hope you enjoyed my little journey so far. I'm having a blast here, having the time of my life. I really have still to do a lot of reading back and forth. So there's a lot of reading in between my shots here, but I still very much enjoy the ride so far. Far. And yeah, again, huge shout out to all of my patrons and channel members out there. You guys are great. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment, like the video and whatnot. This also greatly helps the show. And yeah, with that being said, hope to see you soon in one of my other videos. And until then, bye bye.